career for us. Um, I just want to mention Mita uh, Osborne is starting 25 treatments of radiation, so keep her in your prayers. And how's Tim doing? He's doing well. Okay, good. Okay, so keep Tim in your prayers. He had an operation, so and um, and there's a lot in your handbook. Are your handbook here? Right? Yeah. This thing right here. <laughs> there's a lot of people's names here that's mentioned. So if you can think of them in your prayers, and I ask Julie if she'll come up and pray for us now. Oh no, we'll sing first. <laughs> As usual, I can't follow my own guy here. <laughs> So Father, I adore you. <laughs> Let's sing that together. <laughs>
have to lead services and conquer nerves and things like that. And we know that you can, we can all do anything through you who strengthens us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the choir makes their way up here, we're going to sing a standing on the solid rock. And through most of our lives, our dads were our solid rock. As we were children, my dad was. He got me through a lot of things, especially as a teenager, driving the car. He was very good at that. And he was my rock, my dad. And uh, he's not able to be there for me as much now, but he still always will be my favorite man in the world, and my second favorite is Owen. So. And uh, Owen's Jillian's rock, and he's also my rock now, the replacement of my dad. And Jesus has always been our rock. Always will be, and always forever will be. Whether we uh, uh, can see him or not, he's there. And so we're all standing on the solid rock today.
here. I have something funny to say, but I'm not going to today because it's Father's Day and my father's here. But then Nancy started talking about people being rocks, and I couldn't help but think of what Dad had in his head at times. And then, <laughs> but uh, he'd be upset with me if I hadn't said something like that. Um, it dawned on me a few weeks ago that I had communion thought today, and uh, at the same time I realized that it was going to be Father's Day, and then I realized shortly after that that uh, the dad was going to be here, so I started to try to figure out what to say, uh, you know, what's, what's appropriate and, and what, would be, what would be good. Uh, it, it happened that they came for Taylor's prom last night, of course that was a uh, big time. Um, anyway, since I started putting all these details together, um, I've been thinking about how to tie it into community. That's, that's the struggle, you know. How do you, how do you say something and, and take all those details and, and make it make sense with communion? There's obviously lots of things that you can say about, you know, Jesus' death and, and, and you know, it's the Father's gift and, and whatnot with regards to communion. Uh, but none of them really seemed to strike me and I just didn't think that they'd be all that thought-provoking. So finally, I, I, I've come up with something, so hopefully it'll make sense. But uh, a lot of people know that my father and I are best friends. Um, you, if you've been around the plant or you've been around me at all, you know that that's, that's actually very, very true. Uh, I speak to him every morning. I usually call him on my way to work, uh, which is uh, something that irritates my mother because it's usually quite early in the morning. And, there's a certain time that I'm not allowed to call before because that would just be inappropriate again. But I call him every day on the way to work. And I call him every night on the way home from work. And we usually talk four or five times in between and, and all that. So we're talking quite a bit. Um, so, it, you know, I'm not sure what it says that my best friend is 68 years old uh, and I'm 33. But uh, anyways, it's, it's what it is. And I appreciate that people have different types of relationships with their fathers. Some have strong relationships, some have strained relationships, and some are non-existent. And, and you know, that's just the way it goes in this, in this world that we live in. But my father and I share a bond that, that uh, you know, we've had for many years, and, and it's really inexplicable. I really hope uh, that as Riley grows up, and I wouldn't let him go to junior church, so he's mad at me, but uh, I want him to hear that. I really hope that as he grows up, that him and I will be as close as uh, what my father and I are. And it's gotten so close, Dad and I, that we really can communicate quite a bit without talking at all. And uh, it's not that we have some type of, of superpower where we can read each other's minds. Um, it's just that, you know, we, we know each other. We know each other very, very well. So, you know, I can tell by the way he's got his eyebrow raised that he's listening. And, um, I can tell by the way he would tilt his head whether or not he's upset with me or not. And I can tell by the way that he punches me in the arm that he, he loves me and that he's proud of me. It just hurts a little. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, he's still thinking the same. <laughs> it's been said many times, and you've all heard it, that I actually speak louder than words. Um, so when it comes to my relationship with my father and our relationship, that's very true. And when it comes to this table, it's never true. The Bible, the scriptures, and all of its wisdom and all of its authority would be absolutely useless if it weren't for the actions of this table, if it weren't for the actions that we come around and, and to remember. Uh, God knew each of us so well, he took just the right actions to show us how much he loved us and how much he cared about our well-being. If our fa Heavenly Father did nothing else besides the actions we remember on this table, he would still communicate to us a love that words could never express. I'll give thanks for the bread and the cup. God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the examples in our lives of, of fathers, of men that understand and get what you have tried to convey to us all in scriptures. And we just pray that this morning and this day that uh, we will remember not only physical men in our lives, but the spiritual God and Father that you are, and how you have uh, put in place and have taken action in ways that we just never can understand, and that it means so very much. We thank you for this cup and this bread, which, which symbol symbolize the actions that you took and, and the sacrifice of your son. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Uh, 
I'll update you just real briefly on, uh, on Jared. He's been having a, a fairly uh, good <coughs> recovery from uh, chemo this time. Uh, the good news is that uh, the chemo is working, and, and the bad news is that the chemo is, is working. Uh, today, uh, he, has, he went back to the hospital uh, because his feeding tube site was uh, oozing and, and bleeding. And uh, we've been having ongoing problems with this particular thing since we've started this cycle of chemo uh, a few months ago. Um, because the blood counts in his body have been so wiped out from 2012 when he went through this initially that his body hasn't fully recovered. And so it takes a little bit while longer. And uh, so anyway, that being said, I don't, I don't exactly know what's going on because Christy was taken into the hospital as I was coming, walking over here this morning. So I'm not quite sure what's going on with that. But uh, I'll be headed there today and uh, we'll update on Facebook and, and, uh, and you guys get the word around as far as what's going on. Christy wasn't uh, too worried. It's just one of those things that we have to deal with as we walk through this. So continued prayers are appreciated. Uh, and uh, just, uh, just so that you know, again and again and again, I tell you guys this and I mean it every single time. I just, I can't. I don't know how we get through this without you guys. I don't know how we would get through this without your love, without your prayers, your support, your gifts. Uh, I say this all the time. This is a powerful, powerful church. You are a powerful church. Uh, not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is. He owns this church. And, uh, and you are powerful because of that. And so, again, I just want to say thank you. And uh, appreciate you guys so much for loving us and, and blessing us through this. Uh, today is Father's Day, and so happy Father's Day to, uh, to all. I uh, haven't yet had a chance to call my dad, but I will and wish him a happy Father's Day. Appreciated what Jamie had to say about his dad, and uh, it's very true that um, unfortunately in our world there are folks who don't have very good relationships with their dad or even no relationship at all. Uh, as a youth minister for almost 20 years, I got firsthand opportunity to see, uh, I had a front row seat, so to speak, into the lives of those kids who were growing up with a dad who really loved them for Jesus, and those who didn't have a dad that was around much at all. And I can tell you there's a, there's a huge difference in the lives of kids who have a dad who loves them for Jesus. And so I hope and pray that you're the dad, you're that dad this morning, and I know that many of you are, and uh, appreciate you for it. Uh, every time I think of Father's Day, I think uh, my dad was a great man. I love my dad very, very much, but I always think of my grandpa. Uh, I was very close to my grandpa. He owned a lumber yard. And uh, I, rite of passage in my family as you grew to manhood was you worked at my grandpa's lumber yard. And so one day I noticed that my grandpa took a lot of coffee breaks. He would go get coffee at the local restaurant there in town, and he'd leave me and the other peons uh, to continue working at the lumber yard. One day I just kind of got really upset. And I said, Grandpa, I want a coffee break. I, I want to go on a coffee break. And Grandpa said, Well, is this your lumber yard? <laughs> And I said, no. He said, did you pay for it? Do you own it? And have you worked 50 some odd years to get to where you are? I said, no. He said, I'll tell you what, when you own this lumber yard, you can take as many coffee breaks as you want. And I said, Grandpa, I don't really think that's fair. And my grandpa, well, now there's the problem right there, son. Because I'm not paying you to think. <laughs> Maybe that's a conversation that Jamie's had with his dad. He's not being paid to think. Two weeks ago, we put the Apostle John on a witness stand. And we're walking through his book of 1 John. At the time that John wrote this book, he was the only apostle alive. The last surviving apostle. And so it's pretty important to hear what he has to say. 
But not only was he the last surviving apostle alive at the time that he wrote the book of 1 John, he was also the apostle that was the closest to Jesus. And we made the claim a couple of weeks ago that it's possible that John even knew Jesus better than his own mother did. At least the purpose for who Jesus was and, and what he came to earth to do. John was as close to Jesus as any human being on planet earth. And we talked a couple of weeks ago that if you want to know what Jesus did, read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you want to know what Jesus said, read the Gospel of John. Because John details conversations that are not found anywhere else in the Bible. Because John was close to Jesus. They were best friends. And so for those two reasons, we asked John on the witness stand, who is Jesus? And in 1 John chapter 1, John comes out with a very strong statement. And he said... I know who Jesus is. I walked with him. I touched him. I heard him. In other words, he was as human as you and I are. He is. I'm telling you, John said, my testimony is Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And eternal life is found in him. 1 John chapter and so last week we said, okay, well, that's all fine and dandy, John. He's the son of God and all that. But how do we know we can believe you? How do we know you're the one that can be believed? Back in that day, and even today, some of these heresies still exist or some forms of them. Um, there were two big ones that were around at the time of John. We even talked about it in, in the class, in Vernon's class this morning. Uh, that John, Jesus wasn't really human that he was just a spirit. And that when he resurrected, it was in spirit form. He wasn't really a human being who came, who rose from the dead. It was, it was a spirit who rose from the dead. And that was a form of, uh, of a heresy in the early church called Gnosticism. That's a very simple explanation or summary of it. But John was addressing that heresy when he said, no, Jesus was as human as you and I are. I touched him. I heard him. I talked with him. I had lunch with him. That's the King James Version. I know who Jesus is. There was another heresy that said, John called it in Revelation letter, he called it the Nicolaitans. And that was that these guys believed, or they taught that only certain people could hear God and talk to God and, and tell you God stuff. You couldn't discern that on your own. You needed somebody like them to tell you. And some of these guys were even claiming to be apostles, like John who walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus. And they were lying about their biography, about their history. They lied on their resume about that. And so we're, we want to know, John, how can we believe you? How do we know you're not one of those guys, those false apostle-like guys? How do we know that you're really believable, that your testimony is credible? And so John says, well, because... I lived as Jesus lived. 1 John chapter 2. Those who say they know God live their lives as Jesus did. You know my testimony is credible because of that. Okay, well that's fine. First John tells us who Jesus is. Second, he tells us that those who know God obey him. But is this enough? For a lot of folks, it's not. For a lot of folks, you know Maybe even for some folks that are in here this morning, that's just not enough. John hasn't yet provided enough proof. This is, after all, what everybody wants, right? Proof. John says we can believe his testimony because he lived his life as Jesus did. That makes him a credible witness for Jesus because he, he walked the talk, so to speak. You know, you're willing to listen to someone talk about God stuff if they're living their life accordingly. It's kind of hard to talk to someone about God stuff when you know full well they're not living a godly life. You know what? You know that, right? We have a big H word we call those people, right? What is it? Hypocrite. Yeah, no one wants to listen to a hypocrite. Okay, so we know John's not a hypocrite. But where is the proof that Jesus is who John says he is? Where is that proof? 
So that's the question today that we want to pose to John that he talks about in 1 John chapter 3. John is on the witness stand and he's under oath. And we've asked him, who is Jesus? And he responded. And we've asked him, how do we know we can believe you? And he responded, because I obey him, he said. Fine. Today we're going to press a little harder. John, you say Jesus is the Son of God. You say Jesus loves us. Prove it. Prove it, John. And this is John's response in chapter 3. We know, John responds, we know what real love is. Because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we'll be confident when we stand before God. Now, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but I think it's really cool that the best friend of Jesus says in 1 John 3, 16, the exact same thing he records in his gospel of John 3, 16. We can all quote John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he, that whoever believes will not perish but have. Yeah, we all know that. That's John 3, 16. Here's 1 John 3, 16. Same guy who wrote it. We know what real love is, 1 John 3, 16. Jesus gave up his life for us. The proof of who Jesus is, the love he has for us, is discovered in his death, burial, and resurrection. His willing sacrifice is the proof we need of who he says he is. So on Father's Day, let's just contemplate this for a minute, because that's right. It took a man to show the world what love is. So much of our culture today hates men. Have you, have you noticed that? Maybe it's just me, but it really does seem to me that a lot of our culture hates men, and especially hates fatherhood, denigrates fatherhood to a big degree. Most of the shows, especially the comedies on TV, which I can't bear to watch much of them anymore, but almost all of them reflect dads as these bumbling idiots they can't seem to do anything without some smart and informed woman making decisions for them or saving them from their idiocy. Have you noticed this? One of my favorite TV shows is Everybody Loves Raymond. Did you guys ever see that show? If you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. It's hilarious. And it's a classic example of what I'm talking about. Even though I love the show and I think it's really funny, you know that the main character, if you've watched the show, his name's Ray Barone, is constantly in trouble because he did or said something stupid to his wife. And most married guys, dudes, we can relate. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I mean, it's true. We say and do some stupid stuff sometimes. And it's true that sometimes there is conflict and tension in our marriages because men and women can see things differently. But our culture, it seems to me, through the TV and movies and music and other mediums, is painting men and fathers in a very negative way. And so I can't think of a better way to talk about Father's Day or to celebrate this day than to point to the one who proved to us once and for all, what love really is. So for a second, let's just be countercultural. And let's honor dads. Let's recognize that if it wasn't for this one man, Jesus, we wouldn't know how to live. And if it wasn't for our Father God, 
who sent his son Jesus to us, we wouldn't have a clue how to love. Dads who follow Jesus play an especially important part in our world. They understand that their most significant job is to train their own children to follow Jesus too. Here's how Paul puts it. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Dads who love Jesus obey Jesus. And they train their children to love Jesus too. There are a lot of people in our world that are hungry for love. They're hungry for it. And they're confused about it. Real love. Genuine love. Again, I, I was a youth minister for almost 20 years. I've got a lot of connections with young people on Facebook. I can tell you they are confused as to what this love thing is. It's sad. Most folks have no idea what real love is, and they search for this love that they're looking for in all of the wrong places and with the wrong people. There's only one. There's only one who can show you what real love is. Only one. His name is Jesus. And he proved that by sacrificing himself on the cross. So for those who are confused about what real love is, or if you want affirmation about what real love is, here it is. 1 John chapter 3. How do we know that Jesus loves us? What's his proof? Real love, genuine love, is sacrificial. Now this may not sound at all profound or life-changing. If you've been married for any kind of time at all, you know this to be true. You sacrifice, you make sacrifices for the one you love. But this is a life-changing truth. Genuine love is sacrificial. I tell my daughter all the time that if a boy tells her, a boy her age tells her that he loves her, he's lying. Absolutely, he's lying. He has no idea what love is. And so I tell her, if a boy ever tells you your age, Kyler, while you're an adolescent, a young girl yourself, and a boy ever comes up to you and says, I love you, I want you to ask him, would you be willing to die for me? And if he says, yes, I would, I want you to introduce that boy to me. <laughs> and I'll take care of the rest. <laughs> Of course, I'm joking, sort of. <laughs> but you get the idea. We make sacrifices for the ones we love. The ones we really love. So I know guys, I know men, and I've, I've done this myself. I have, to be, I've, I have to be confronted with this truth just like any other person. Sometimes we'll sacrifice time and money to do a lot of stuff. Whatever it is, hunt, fish, golf, whatever. Sometimes we make sacrifices for things that aren't healthy at all. Like alcohol or gambling or porn or other stuff like that. And it seems sometimes to me that guys can make a lot of money and a lot of time, a lot of investment in these things, but when it comes to taking the wife on a weekend to a bed and breakfast somewhere or sharing some kind of romantic weekend with them, they, they can't seem to bring themselves to do that. You make sacrifices for what you love. Period. For what you really love. And this is why Jesus made a sacrifice for you and me. This is why he made the sacrifice for you and me. Because he loves us. Truly, really does. 
The reason the world has no idea what love really is is because the world at its very core is selfish. And genuine love isn't selfish. So the boy who tells a girl he loves her so he can get to second base isn't being loving. He's being selfish. The man who says he loves his wife but routinely ditches her so that he can do what he wants to do isn't being loving. He's being selfish. The daughter who says she loves her dad so he'll give her some cash to go to the mall isn't being loving. She's being selfish. And I really hope that you get the point that we all struggle with this selfish thing. Right? We all do. This is why Jesus says this in Luke 9, 23. If you want to follow me, you must put away your selfish nature, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. What's the first thing Jesus tells us we need to do? Lay down what? Selfish. Our selfishness. Yeah, it's, we have to because we can't be selfish in love at the same time. Those two things are not synonymous. Real love is sacrificial. This is love. Real love. Genuine love. And that kind of love doesn't fail. Fake love fails all the time. Real, genuine love doesn't fail. One of the greatest NBA players of all time is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And he once said this. Now, keep in mind, this is the greatest player. Most sports people who follow basketball say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was the best player of all time. And this is what he says. A team will always appreciate a great individual if he's willing to sacrifice for the group. I'm going to ask Vernon and Nancy to make their way down up here. We're going to conclude here this morning. So how does a team know that a guy like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the best ever, can you imagine being on a team with that guy? How does a team know that that guy loves them and appreciates them and wants to play with them? Because he makes sacrifices for them. That's how they know that. Maybe he shares the spotlight. Maybe he gives up some big plays so the other guys can have some time in the highlight reel. Maybe he shows them that he's willing to practice longer, work out harder than anybody else on the team. John simply put it this way. Dear children, don't merely say you love each other. Show the truth. Prove it. Prove it with your action. God says he loves us. And we tell Jesus to prove it. And he did. On the cross. He proved his love for us. He sacrificed himself for us. So this morning, don't just say you love God. Don't just let the words come off your mouth. Don't just sing the song. Prove it. Real love is sacrificial. If you're looking for real love, the only place to look is to Jesus. Let's pray. God, this morning, I'm just extremely grateful for the promises that you provide in your word. There, there are a lot of folks, even in this room this morning, who are struggling with a lot of different kinds of stuff. I have my own struggles, but everybody else has their own as well. And it's amazing to me, God, how one word can cut through all of the different things that we struggle with, <coughs> can cut through like a knife, like a sword straight to the source of what we need to understand. All of us, no matter what it is we're dealing with, no matter what sin we bring in here today, what our sinful, selfish nature brings to here today, doesn't matter. 
There's only one thing that matters, and that is that Jesus Christ sacrificed himself so that we, didn't have, so we don't have to live with it. We can leave these burdens at your feet. And I pray that this morning. I pray all of us this morning, with what I'm dealing with, what anyone else in this room is dealing with, I pray, God, that we will be convinced the proof of how much you love us is in what you did for us. God, I just want to thank you for that. I can walk free of my problems. I can walk free from my sin. I just need to put my faith in you. John tells us that those who love you obey you. I pray, God, that, that you'll work on my heart. I pray, God, that you'll work on my heart because I want to obey you more and more and more. I want to love you more and more and more. And I pray that for all of us, God, this morning, no matter what we're dealing with or struggling with, I pray that. I pray that into our heart, into our minds, into our spirit, that we will want to love you more and more. We're going to want to obey you more and more. I pray that, God. I lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.